All right. Uh, this is a special board of directors meeting, January 5th at 3 p.m. Calling the meeting to order. Uh, yes, I'd like to first explain what the, this meeting is about so that you understand. Uh, <clears throat> with the spill that occurred around December 27th, uh, the generate diesel generator has been op once it came back online it's been operating ever since and this is today we're going to uh, show the board what transpired and where we were at we are at and what it will take to get back to utility power with Tillamook PUD uh, if you've been by Neatart's pump station You've probably heard the racket. The diesel generator has been running ever since. So, uh, if that's going to be the main discussion here today, if anybody who's a guest would like to make a statement, I will give you up to five minutes to make that statement uh, at the front of the uh, discussion. You're welcome. Anything you'd like to say? I'm, I just would love to learn. Excuse learn, me. I just want to learn more about what what the, the change in like as you go back to the regular power. Okay. Okay. So, with that in mind and understanding that, um, let's see. Does may, may I give you this real quick? Um, I understand that part of your emergency spill plan, you are to notify any business that draws water out of the bay. I did not receive that notification, so maybe it's because you don't have my info. Um, um, we, do, we do not. Okay. Yeah, and I don't think that, uh, I don't believe that any of the uh, direct phone numbers are on that are on that list that DEQ required us to put on there. Uh, Myself, I know also Jacobson and Whiskey Creek. Also, yeah, those uh, they also draw the water. Uh, I, I, I just, I, 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 I sent you a copy. I'm just handing you my contact info so okay. I can be added to that list. Okay. And that's why I was not notified. Okay. Under 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 Jacobson draws water and Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery also draws water. Okay, uh, the, the board has some options, I think, or a list of options, and I don't know if uh, the guests, if you want uh, to, as you continue to try to understand things, maybe we could make a few more copies of this so that they just have that in their possession. Okay. And then I'm going to turn it over to Dan who will describe the events that occurred and where we are, how things happened, and where we are today, and what the options are. Okay. So on December 26th, in the late afternoon, uh, one of the operators was on the um, our SCADA system, and he noticed uh, an odd flow that didn't seem to be right. So. He went down there and checked it, and we had one set of pumps that had faulted out at the Detarts pump station. And at that time, he reset the pumps, as we normally do, put it back online, and he noticed that there was a blinking indicator light on the generator's transfer switch, which is your ATS that we refer to. And on there, it says that it indicated that the transfer switch was not set in auto has to be set in auto for it to automatically sense a power outage and then go to generator power. So he called and notified me, I told him to reset it, it would reset and then it would come back every 10 seconds or so. So um, we knew there was a problem with the automatic transfer switch at that time. We ran a test and how you run the test is you go to the breaker or the pump station, you shut off your incoming utility power, that should trip 
the automatic transfer switch to start the generator up and then switch over to uh, auxiliary power. That didn't work. So we immediately got on the phone trying to get a number that would answer. Uh, you know, it was a day after Christmas at Cummins. And we finally got a, I got a hold of somebody, a manager, about 9.30 at night. So it took us about three hours to contact help. And uh, we were still on utility power. It was still pumping. Um, so n nothing had broke it, uh, nothing had stopped it from uh, uh, flowing at that time. They, dis they dispatched out a, um, a tech to come work on it. He, re he showed up at 12.30 a.m. So when he went in there, he worked on it from, and we're still on utility power. He worked on it from 12.30 to 2.30, 2.45, and said that he said he couldn't get it to work. And um, so he was gonna return to the shop and they were gonna dispatch somebody else out hopefully with some parts to fix it. They didn't get anybody back to us till 6 p.m. that evening. And what we found out was on the automatic transfer switch, which you have these photos, the board has these photos, um, there, are, there are two positions inside that panel. Here's another set. Here's another set. Somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're you're kind of going to need all three sheets if you're going to follow along. There you go. So this is a picture. This one here is the picture of the inside of the control panel. And on the inside of the control panel, off to when you're looking straight on it, off to the left side, you'll see this uh, silver mechanism with all the white wires running into it. That is what controls your emergency transfer power. That's what transfers it from utility power to auxiliary power. So normally on utility power, your upper, your, your upper shaft, so if you go to the blow up, it's easier to read it, it's easier to look at it here. So this is simply just a picture of what's on the side, bolted to that transfer switch. Right here it says open, and then the bottom one says closed. So when you lose utility power, that will go to open. The lower switch will automatically transfer to closed position, and that's, what's, that's what then gives auxiliary power to, to energize the pump station, okay? What happened was to the lower one, after it had ran at 9 a.m. on its weekly, Monday weekly morning uh, test, it all worked. When it transferred back, we're assuming that's when the lower shaft broke. Something in it broke, and um, it would not allow it to go back to. Uh, it would not allow it to switch back to auxiliary. So, in the pump station, would these have manual overrides for us? So they anticipate that your automatic transfer switch, the automatic portion, runs with the circuit boards and stuff like that something can go wrong or a limit switch. So we have what a manual override. Um, in the bottom of the panel, on the big picture, you'll see something that looks like a socket, like you would take a spark plug out of a chainsaw or something. That goes into the side and we can manually transfer it without the automatic transfer switch. The lower one was stuck, it would not move. It was jammed up. We didn't know what was stopping it, we couldn't see it, and we can't get into high voltage in these panels. So we got Cummins there, Cummins there, they couldn't, they couldn't get it to work either. He didn't know why it was stuck in the, in the closed position, or in the open position, I'm sorry. And he worked on it, like I said, till about 2.30, 3 o'clock. We were still on utility power, even though the storm was battering us pretty bad with winds that night. And we knew we had to get this running because chances of losing power, utility power was great. So we stayed on utility power until uh, 117. We had, uh, one of the operators was down at the pump station. Tuesday afternoon, right? Two, yeah, Tuesday afternoon. 
it all kind of bleeds into one day for us because we were out there. But anyway, so yes, by Tuesday afternoon, the generator, uh, the utility power finally went out in Detards. We called um, Zwald to get him coming out, road conditions, storm, flooding, and all that. He took him an hour and a half to show up where it usually takes him about 45 minutes. That's the trucker? That's the trucking company. So we got them out there. We still had no confirmation when, when Cummins Tech was going to be there. So we called Morgan's Electric in, in Toma. He responded out, and what we wanted him to do was anything he could to bypass that switch with, these, with all these cables. Okay. At this time, we didn't know how the switch technically worked, how it was wired. And um, so as Morgan was working on it, um, he, he, he couldn't get it apart, he couldn't get it to work. So he worked on it for a couple hours and then Cummins showed up. And we'd already had, by, by 4.45, the trucks had showed up. We started, well, first report to me about the spill was at 3.15 from the fire chief. I'd had the guys leave the pump station at 255 because the truck driver needed to know if it was open, the road was open to the treatment plant because it was closed earlier. And so we couldn't access it. Uh, we actually, the fire chief took Tyler down to the pump station before uh, the power went out. So the other guys came back, they verified that PUD had opened the road, 131 down here where it was closed, right by the capes. And so we verified with the trucks that they could deliver a haul, haul um, the sewer here to the treatment plant. And so that, that began at uh, 3.45. Uh, about, uh, no, 4.45. About 4.15 or 5.15. What time did you get there? You got there at 3.45. Okay, 3.45, it spilled for about roughly 30 minutes from the time that we were made aware of. And um, it was mainly diluted stormwater. And so um, I went down there. We got the information. I got the information I needed. I checked the reported, um, I believe they reported that it was spilling out of a manhole in front of the schooner, which it was. We went over and checked. I went over and verified that. Came back up. We called in the report. The report didn't have a gallon on it because we didn't know how fast it would take for the trucks pumping down and stopping. It wasn't a lot coming out, but it, it was enough. And so the estimated 1,500 gallons, because with no power, we have no way, like in when the force main broke, we had no way to calculate how much there was. There was no pressure readings. There was no overflow readings. There was no nothing. So it, it was a guess. Um, so at that point, the trucks got started within 30 minutes. They had completely stopped all overflowing, discharging mm -hmm. out of there, out of the manholes and everything. They they um, they hauled until 9 a.m. when um, Cummins um, Tech showed up at six. He worked on it. He finally got it on generator power at exactly 9 p.m. And then that's when we stopped the truck. The transfer switch is still broken. The reason we're still on um, diesel power, on auxiliary power, because if, if we throw the switch for utility power right now, it will transfer back to utility. We have no, no way to transfer it back if there's another, another power outage. And right after a storm, you don't know if PUD is going to come back and if they're going to have to shut it off to fix something. So. I made the choice just to keep it on generator power. It is still running on generator power because we've been working for the last nine days to try to get parts to fix this. And we just received an hour before this meeting from Cummins the quote, we have to buy a, a whole new transfer switch just to rob the parts off of it. We tried to order, Cummins tried to order the part and it's, it's build to order. So the manufacturer wouldn't even uh, uh, give an estimate of three to six months. So our choices are, one, we buy that transfer switch, have it overnighted up here. They will take the parts off needed and repair that transfer switch down there. So it's, it's identical to what is already there. And 
And so that's that's where we're at with that. Looks like one, well, I have to get this approved to get it back so that they will purchase it, so they'll send it to us. And then we'll schedule, they'll we'll schedule. The, the price on here of the $16,924, that includes them coming over, taking the parts, repairing the transfer switch that's down there now, and putting it back into service. Okay. Does, does the board understand the sequence of events and what occurred? And you're comfortable with that? Okay. I'm going to take a uh, leap of faith here. Do you all more or less understand what happened? I was there. Yeah. I watched it all. The timelines don't match, but that's irrelevant. The problem is fixing it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's interesting to hear Dan's students walking through it. Um, why? So if the transfer switch is that critical and we're looking at just getting back on to PV power, um, it doesn't feel like there's any redundancy in the, the pump system, the power for it. it it's a repair. They're repairing the transfer switch. It will go back into autom automatic mode. But you're asking why isn't there another one just sitting it's there such a critical on the shelf? System that this well, is there's not. That, so, go ahead. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll I was just wondering if the concern on getting it back into PV power, like, is there another spill risk as you make that repair and no. transfer back? We won't. We will not transfer off of generator power until we're assured from Cummins that that switch is repaired. Back to operation. So you ask it. Why don't we have spare parts if it's so critical? Um, even Cummins will tell you that these, this, what broke is our backup. So we anticipate, and so does Cummins, that that an automatic transfer switch, running off circuit boards and PLCs, you could have something fail. So as operators, we're trained to go to the manual backup. We've never had a manual backup break. Ever, we've had we've had we've had transfer switches that wouldn't work on automatic, and had a problem there. But we've always go in. There's safety procedures. You shut down the, the incoming power for safety. You shut down the generator. You manually switch it. Then you turn your generator back on, which brings your pump station treatment plant or something back. So you're on repairing line. this 17 year old transfer switch. Why aren't we upgrading to the so that's the next discussion, but, but, but I can answer that pretty quickly. In order to get it back up and running and dependable, because right now, you run a risk staying on the generator. I mean, we all know, I mean, we just put $12,000 in the radiator in it in May. How many hours does it have on it? This, this generator? Yeah. Do you know what the total hours are from 05? Do you guys not have anyone that does the maintenance on the generator? Do you always have to call out? To it's Cummins or? equipment. So you, you we don't call. have anyone that repairs it here on site. You always have to call and have them come. But you're doing maintenance right? log and all that. Yeah, well, we do the minor. What I'm going to call the minor maintenance: oil changes, battery changes, alternator, things like that. But when you get into the three-phase electrical portion of it, we're not electricians, and our policy doesn't even allow us to get into these panels or or this. So. There is a redundancy built in all generator transfer switches. The problem was the redundancy on this one is what broke, and we couldn't get it back to move. We we still I still don't know exactly what broke in there. We we will once we get the old one off and we have a look at it. So this gets us back up and running. This transfer switch worked for 17 years. We will put new parts back in it, not used or anything like that. The reason we're taking parts off the new switch is because it would take longer with high flows, winter storms, it would take us longer and the risk would be higher if we tried to take the whole panel off and then rewire the whole panel back on. So we will, we will put the new parts on it 
and because the transfer switch will be operational. So the new there. transfer switch is down the road a ways. So yes. Saying. So what what would we first ask Cummins give us the up if we're going to have to change out the transfer switches, give us the upgraded new ones, kind of like what we have with the treatment plant, that that the it's easier and safer for the operators to make the manual transfer. Twelve months out. Twelve months out. If you order it now. But you have to have all the specs for the new new style transfer switch. The new ones are actually cheaper than this by almost half. So the next plan is after we get this back up, we get this working, and we're and we're 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 happy and we trust it as much as you can anything mechanical, then we're going to start the project of bringing in the engineers to upgrade that panel to something new. So it, we're not we're not staying with this, okay? This is this is this is a repair job, but we need to change this panel out to something more modern. It, one, the, the the new ones are more dependable, and they're safer for the operators to go into manual mode because so, everything. Is so the new one's twelve months out, and the, this older style's on the shelf. Right. Okay. So what the district is working on right now is. Oceanside pump station, it runs off the generator at the main pump station. And we're putting in a manual transfer switch and we're buying a portable generator. I want to do that for all the pump stations, including the Neetarts pump station. How many are there? Seven, there are seven pump stations. Oh, there are seven generators, and there are nine pump stations. But Two of the pump you, you'd right have here. one generator. You wouldn't have a spare at every place. You could right. So it. it would be a portable generator that we could run down there, and they would plug in, shut off whatever they need to do to disconnect, and then they would run off generator power. And so it would be a second backup generator. Uh, this is harsh weather that we live in and harsh conditions, and. Um, I'm a firm believer in a backup for your so backup. So you're saying you got a, a trailer mounted one you can take to all seven of the Well, except for the main. The, the main, that's a giant B12 generator. It's almost one meg. So you're not going to relatively find one unless it's mounted on a semi-trailer. But we can get more security for the, um, for the pump stations that are around the bay. So it, it's something we can take to... Happy Camp, which you know is at the mouth of the bay, something we take to Ocean Highlands, something we can take to Detarts. So that is also, you will see that, we'll be working on the, that project as well, designing that. Okay. So we're, we're starting with the Oceanside Pump Station, which I know doesn't affect you guys if it goes down or not, but it's still a spill point. We'll, we'll get a generator that will work at at least three or four of the other smaller pump stations, uh, but Neetarts is going to require a larger one because it runs 60 horse pumps and not 7 to 10 horse pumps. But they'll all have, eventually they're all going to have on, uh, uh, backups for their automatic transfer switches, which are manual. Now you may go by and see a trailer mounted generator back then, but that's because either we're shutting down the pump station for maintenance or we have to do repairs. And you asked the hours, it was yeah. 1,730 hours okay. as of yesterday. So it's going to be a little more today. Which is, which is pretty low for a diesel generator. Yeah. Uh, there was some repairs done on that generator in June? Uh, well, we ordered in May. So yeah, June, we, we noticed there was a lot of corrosion with the radiator okay. and the air-to-air -air unit, which cools the air from the turbo. So uh, we just went ahead and replaced that. We didn't want it to fail on us. And at the same time, we would had a front oil leak, and we made other repairs, changed all the radiator hoses out. I anything that was, could be a failure point, we changed on that. Basically, done. Or yeah, just questions or. 
what's on the table is so, the 16K to cannibalize a new available one in California that can get it with. And the 16K is for both of those. So, so yeah, so so the 16,000 16, is purchasing, it's $13,111 for the transfer switch, but the first page uh, tells you itemizes out what they're doing. Uh, that will, that will, they'll have it shipped directly from here out of Sacramento, California. They'll set up a time for the tech to come out. He will take the parts off that he needs and he will put in the other transfer switch. This Cummins the tech? This Cummins is the tech. So that's all, that's all included in the price. And the time frame on that? We're running a Until I time. sign this and get it back to him today, I won't know, because they won't order it until I sign this. So I have no idea. Just, we have an open ended. Oh, bill yeah, so my understanding from the sales staff is that we sign it, they will get it overnighted. If it's too late today, it won't overnight till the following day. They had to verify that we had something here to lift it with, which we do forklifts and cranes to unload it, and then a way to transport it down to the Etars pump station. So we're probably looking at, we're going to run on generator through the weekend. And most likely, if I had to guess right now, probably till at least Wednesday. So we have another week of diesel. Yeah, so we're, we're burning right now uh, since a lot of the storm had passed and the flows have dropped. We're, um, we're averaging every three days about 150, well, about 433 gallons. Uh, we just had it filled on the 3rd and on the 5th, it took another 150 gallons. Now, because we're going through the weekend, and we normally do this for storm times in the winter, because if the storms are bad enough and you can't get diesel trucks out here, we keep 355 gallon drums of diesel in that pump station that we can pump directly in so it doesn't run out of fuel. How much does the flow, like just your hydraulic load, vary? Can you measure that from just that transfer station? You, um, you, you can't me measure the flow. The only flow that is measured is up here. But our flow increased from normally about 180,000 gallons, 150 to 180, to 970,000. Per? Oh, uh, in, it, it did that within 24 hours. But is that a 24-hour uh, measurement? The yes, thousand? yes. Because you, you said that when we were there at the bay and then I never had the context for how much time that was. So, so you'll see six and seven times hydraulic loading with the rain events? So you can. Uh, the last one happened in 2015. The one before that was in 2012 where it jumped that high. So what happens in the rain events, and I know all of you have driven on heavy rain roads, that rain goes somewhere and it goes in through your manholes. Uh, especially on some of the county roads, some of those culverts aren't large enough and they will flood the road, which will submerse our, our, um, our manholes and all that water just, just pours in. And so usually, when we're under a storm event like we were Monday night into Tuesday, uh, it stopped raining, I don't know, was it 10 o'clock at night? The wind still kept up, but the rain stopped. And usually we know it's from flooded roads or something because our flows will start to drop off in about an hour after it starts it stops raining. So then the pumps can keep up. But when the roads are flooded, those four pumps, that pump station isn't designed to take that kind of flow. to keep up with it anyway? When we watched the first truck pump, it was one minute before it was all overflowing. Mm -hmm. Like all of your pipe, all, all the all the sewer lines. I'll show you how to take that. So the sewer lines from out here at Wilson Road, these are this is the sewer line that feeds to this pump station. This is the other one that feeds along here. All this stuff feeds in. But this will backfill up this, it basically turns it into a holding tank. So you have, you have a 12 inch line here. Some of these other ones are eight inch, but 12 inch over by the schooner. 
all this, all this converges to this pump station. That's Three of those were, were overflowing and spewing out the top already. One of, one of them up the bay, too. Okay, so... It had all filled up. Like, right, so, so I... The guys went and checked. We didn't see anything flowing out of any of them up the bay road, but we did when you pointed out over at the schooner. We verified that one. The one at in front of the wet well at the pump station, you know, that was sitting there, but nothing up the road we found was coming out. There is one at, at the bottom of Park Avenue. When the storm water comes down there, it gives the appearance it's coming out of the manhole, but it's not. But the storm water is covering the manhole and then going across the road. Oh, so just maybe flowing over the top and you just yeah. See on, on on this one, if you see it coming out down here, here, well, you know, where you're pointing. By yeah, the yeah. So this one, th this one gives the appearance that it because it's lower, it gives the appearance that it's overflowing, but it's not. It's just in the streamline, the ditch line of where the storm drainage, and you know that road doesn't have any real storm ditches or way that controls it that's pretty bad but so that one we didn't report because it wasn't technically okay. a spill so once the lines surcharge it takes a while for it to pump back down so when Zwalt started hauling with their 5,000 gallon tankers it took it took about a half an hour I think two two loads each truck before it started stopped surging and coming out Yeah, those trucks, those trucks are pretty awesome. And it was a minute before yeah. it was all just coming out again. That's why we call them and not rotor rooter. Let's see, do you have a motion to bear it? No. <laughs> we, we, since he just got the, yeah. uh, the invoice, I, I don't have a motion, but is everybody has had a chance to look at the options and we're in agreement that the only real tenable option is to go ahead and order this, uh, what's on this invoice, then, is that? Yeah, so we're ordering the invoice, or no, there's no one yet. Um, ordering the parts, and then we'll go and decide what we want to do next. Well, what we need right now is actually critical, that we owe yeah. Ken Cummins to order this. Yeah. But that won't be the only expenditure. We still have diesel, and then we'll have Zawal back out on standby. We're going to pump everything down. They're estimating two hours to change the switch out. We, you know that we have rain again. And uh, th this would have been the ideal day to do it, because our flows had dropped down to 180,000 today. So the higher the flow, you know, the faster everything fills up and the harder it is. So what we would do before we start is we'll pump everything down, we'll get the pumper truck set up, and he'll pump if we need him to. But we need him sitting there on site ready to go. Because what he can't do is play catch up like he did when he came out Tuesday. So he'll start pumping and hauling even if we're not full. So when he gets enough in the wet well for a load, we'll load that load out and we'll take it. So where's the wet well at? So you know the big square concrete yeah. with the post sticking yeah. up? That's the wet that's well. That's like a big tank or something? Yeah, or? that's that's a wet well. That's a wet well that goes down in. I think it's uh, 20 feet down in the ground. So he pumps that and then that backup line down the road flows into... Well, so everything will gravity into there as normal. The only time it's going to backfill is if the, if, the, if the wet well fills up faster than he can pump out. Then what it'll do is start what's called surcharging the lines. It goes back in the lines. Yeah, which surcharging the lines, even at 300,000 gallons a day, it still takes three hours before we reach spill. So when we lost the power at 117, it didn't start spilling. I know we have a difference in timelines, but I can only go from when it's reported to me. So the fire chief, Nikai's fire chief called you? It's all about the same time we even showed up. That was bad timing for you. Yeah. 
So anyway, uh, it, even at this time of the year, if that's empty and it starts surcharging, it still buys us a couple hours be, before it gets critical. And that's about how much time lapsed as far as I know. If somebody knows an earlier time it, it started coming out, they can share that. But that's when I was notified. It was at 315. And they had just left down there at 255 and it wasn't spilling yet. So you just need approval for the capital expenditure? Um, or you want advance approval for the whole body lines? Um, technically, I don't even I already have pre approval. That's right. Well, I actually yeah. thought. Yeah. <laughs> so I already have pre approval. What is this? Is there an action item? The, the, the problem was when John called this meeting, was we didn't, we didn't have. And so we were going to discuss options of what we're going to do. One of the options is, which is really not an option, it's mandatory, you stay on generator power. And we just keep paying out, you know, $2,000 a week in diesel until we get this thing repaired. We could go back right now to uh, um, utility power, but then if it takes you two or three hours to get a tech over here to mess with that switch to get it back, then that's a higher risk than just leaving the generator running and keeping the pump station up, keeping it operational. The risk was too high to go back to utility power at this time. Then when we, we keep in touch with PUD, they were expecting this storm that came today, a little bit yesterday and today. And I believe there's going to be some tomorrow as well. So you know what happens when the wind gusts come up, you start breaking, knocking trees over, breaking branches, power goes out um, and we can't get our auxiliary power back on, we're right back to where we started. And just for long-term context, as I understand it, based on all the, the meetings, the Tillamook Oceanside utility line that is in process coming from Tillamook over the estuary and up over Maxwell Mountain is going to provide a redundant source of power so that stuff going off at Whiskey Creek or even 131 is going to, they're going to be able to switch and have the power be coming and, yes. over the mountain. So in terms of long-term planning. Well, PD already has the conduits running back down this road into Oceanside. Oh, I know. Yeah, we installed that. that. It's the wire. It's the, it's yeah, the, yeah. You, you need to get the substation. So, so when we're talking about 17 years, you yeah. know, and parts and risk, one of the things is that at some point within hopefully the next 10 years, 8 to 5, we'll have actually PD will have a redundant line coming to Ocean Site because that will reduce the number of outages. Because right now, we have more than two times, or I think three times, the number of outages of the next highest area of Tillman County. We, we burn annually in our generators probably $3,000 of diesel every year. Of course, that's, that fluctuates on the price of fuel. But that's how it usually averages out between exercising the generators and then actual power outages. So I would rather that the window of risk actually has an end point or at least mm -hmm. a narrow end point yeah. at some point you know, mm -hmm. in the next five to ten years. So as long as it can connect Oceanside to knee tarts. So as long as there's this, I don't know, yes. back all the way into knee tarts. That actually does come down to knee tarts. And PUD did tell us that night when we called to find out when we were going to get power back before, you know, after it went out. They said, you're not getting it back today. So again, I'm sorry, but do we have an action item we need to act on? Um, I'm going to sign this and send it back to Cummins. Um, I didn't know if the board uh, wanted information. I think John wanted more information for the board members, where we're at, cost-wise. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, cost-wise. Cost and the other aspects of it is <clears throat> what's going to be installed is technology that is 2005 or pre, it is not 2022 technology, plus they have informed us, I believe, that since it has been sitting on the shelf for a period of time, that the two-year warranty, they are not going to warranty this item either. I mean, I, I put that in the memo, but I think that's important to know that we're, you know, there's, it's not great, but there is a little bit of risk in this item, which we need to have done, but we don't have any backstop from uh, warranty.
tee or whatever for this item? This part will replace the redundancy for us. So even if the automatic transfer sensors go out, something, we will still have the ability to go in there and manually transfer. It, 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 it restores the redundancy. And it's a brand new part. I mean, this isn't used. This is a brand new part. The reason we're not changing out putting the whole brand new panel in is it would take too long. And the risk is too high. So, with that said, I'd, I'd like to go ahead and uh, make a motion that uh, Dan proceed with the invoice for the replacement of the automatic transfer switch. I'll second. Uh, any further discussion? We kind of beat this up. All no, right. no, this is good. I, I don't take me long. No. Every bit of this information was important and good to have. This meeting was important. I was just trying to get to the... We actually had DEQ was here today. Uh, they, they, they do our inspections at our lab, and he wanted to go down and look at the pump station and the area, and because he's concerned about, you know, the, the bay as well. Is this so, the same inspector, Rick Bailey? Uh, Randy Bailey, yes. Yeah, he, he's actually our compliance officer for, I think, here in Telemark and a couple others. So. We gave him a tour of that so he could get the layout of how it's all laid out. Have you not seen it before? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, now that's can one we, thing that's well, very... Wait a minute. We've got to hold on for just a moment. All in favor of uh, oh, the sorry. motion is proposed, say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, Doesn't mean to cut you off. Is that we're, wait, we're getting sidetracked here. So that's further right, discussion. So, I'm going to backtrack what I just said. Yes, he's been here, but no, he's never been to that pump station. Okay. He's been here, done the side-by-side. -side. They do an audit on our paperwork, which they did today. Side-by-side -side testing to see if our results are the same. But no, you, generally, they don't tour Is the there system. any other risk point even close to the, that transfer station? The, the, the pump stations that you have? Are there, are there other risk points of failure? Yeah, that are that high. To me, that one just seems like such a big risk. Well, that one's, that one's critical. <laughs> okay, that one's critical because it collects sewer from half a camp, pumps to that pump station. The Ocean Highlands uh, development, it pumps and collects and goes to that pump station. All of NETARTS goes to that pump station. Oh. What happens if we have a hotel built out there the pump station doesn't run 99 percent of the time at maximum but when you have these one in five and one in ten year storms those are deq's terms not not mine just yeah. so that i don't get beat up here those events are already calculated in they can't overbuild the pump station if they overbuild it then the sewer can sit in there too long we can't get it up here and treat it. Um, the public doesn't like to pay millions more for something. I'll just be honest with you. So everything is built to what is required. At the time, with a 20 year horizon, meaning that they try to look 20 years out for build out and for growth. Now, they use history for that. And so that was in 2005. So the design was actually 2003 when it started. It takes a couple of years before you actually start breaking ground. So we're at 20 years then. We're getting there. And it is in our facility plan. That pump station, not to change those, but to upgrade uh, mechanicals in it. So last year, when the old control panel, which could also be a failure point, uh, when it became obsolete to get all the parts to fix it, we then upgraded that that uh, that control panel to a modern one so it's only a year old so we try to keep ahead of that um, that part there is nothing which kind of surprised me there is no literature out there on how many cycles a transfer switch is good for which you would think they would know that through testing how many times can it transfer before it needs this new shaft put in it Got to upgrade equipment yeah. so periodically. 
Well, well, maybe that 20 years should be reduced because everyone knows vehicles don't last as long as they used to anymore. That's the, any, any that's the design. You're expected to look at your stuff every five years, which we do. That's why we replace the control panel. You try to get as much life out of everything you can because of your user rates and, and stuff like that. You don't want to you don't want to be throwing money away. You want to get as much use out of one. But I don't believe in getting so much use until it finally just fails on you. I prefer like the like the control panel. We changed that out because I knew that it was a failure point. So we changed it out before it failed. We're going to reevaluate with the operators, all of our transfer switches, every one of them, and try to find out what their weak points are. We learn quite a bit off of this with the techs here that we can bring a local electrician out, somebody who's like, a, like Morgan or something. They can, uh, there's actually a way to bypass that entire switch and hook directly to the generator, which there isn't anything in our manuals that tells us we can do that. And even the, even the generator text would come and says, yeah, you can take these off and put them here. If we had known that Monday night from the tech that was here, we would have had them do that anyway because we knew the chances of a power outage, and I'm sure all of you did, with the storm coming, we knew there was gonna be a power outage. Or the chances were in the high 90 percentile that it was gonna happen. So we learned and we have now a way, if this transfer switch mechanism fails the same way, we're not gonna waste any time. We're gonna drag the electrician out and we're going, to, we're going to move those cables over to the generator. And we can do it the opposite way. We can bypass the generator if something happens with it and put it directly without going through the transfer switch and then we can go directly to utility power without, without having to, if, if both of these switches break, both of these levers break, we now know the, how we can switch the switch the cables around to get power back to it. Either way. The 20 years is low, not, not length of time of operation. The 20 years is close to planning. Yeah. Right. Well, it is. But that's what I'm kind of saying. Yeah. Every, everything you buy now anymore is the amount of time that you get out of it. It's not what it used to be. You don't get 40 years out of a pump anymore. You just don't. We have to PM our pumps, which is preventive maintenance. Those have to be done every couple of years. And we try to get those sent in before they fail. There's a lot of redundancy. I know you're, you, you, get, you have a hard time believing this when I say this. That pump station has a lot of redundancy built into it. We can lose up to three pumps, because we have a spare. Uh, we can lose up to three pumps and still keep that pump station operational. These guys can change a pump in less than 20 minutes. We have what's called cross ties in there. And at some time, if you guys would like to go in there and see how it operates, we can show you. We can lose a wet well pump and a dry pit pump on, on either side, and we can switch to the other side. Or if we lose these two, we can switch. So we have backups. Um, transfer switches have backups. But who would have ever dreamt that the backup was, was going to break? So... That's what got us, and if we could have got them over here sooner, I mean, if, if Cummins had got their tech back here, we were, I was on the phone with them all day trying to get them here. And of course, it was storm, not just here, but in the state. So their techs were already out on other generator calls. But if we could have got them here that morning, eight, nine, 10, 11 o'clock, we'd have, we'd have had that before the power went out. We'd have been on generator power before the power ever went out, because we didn't trust it. So now we can't. Mm -hmm. what? So now we can't. Mm -hmm. Advantage we want to switch to the generator We now have options beyond what we knew before Tuesday. Uh, something else. There's a facilities plan, which is, is what was it? 2017, 2018. When it was updated? Yeah. Yeah. And it's about 400 pages long, and it also has a long list of things that need to be looked at and considered, along with describing the whole plant and how it operates 
and it's probably coming up in the next year or two to be uh, revised again. But I mean, it is, it is basically the Bible of the, the whole operation here. So, I mean, it's due for upgrade. And Dan threw out a term, which I figure you must all know, SCADA, <laughs> when he first started. But basically what that is, it's the electronic system and all the power system that watches what's going on with the system. And they can basically, from their cell phones, get a lot of information about what may be happening anywhere in the system. Yeah. That was pretty good reaction time, night after Christmas. Our SCADA system measures, it, it shows the flow on a graph. So you can see pump cycles, pump start, pump shut off, pumps, and how long they pump. Uh, if you look at the one for the 26th through the, into the 27th, you'll see the pumps start, the second set start, then it pumps up and it doesn't shut off for hours and hours. Because it'll stay in constant pump mode because the water's coming in faster than even four pumps could pump it out. Now that's a rarity when that happens, but it, it does happen. Motion for adjournment. Uh, yeah. And your second. second. And so to adjourn. For the, the next board meeting? Will be the third Thursday. Will we um, continue some of the preventive conversations? Uh, certainly possible. 